Um, so I think it would be really nice for us to open this general question that Matt has posed out to the audience for both um, inputs and for maybe specific questions that might come from it. Um, just before we do that though, I'd like to ask each of the panel if they can answer one of my questions, which is um, for an organisation, or your organisations are a little bit different, but for an organisation or a complex set of organisations like yourselves, um, in making that move to uh, making sure that the work that you fund is published as open access, what would you say is the most important thing to, to take into account and one of the most important considerations to, to make in, in terms of making that transition? One of the most important choices we have to make, and I think any institution would be able to take into account, is whether to have a broad ranging open knowledge policy, which, we, uh, which was our choice, or whether to focus on <laughs> making specific things openly accessible through your research. And I think in DFID, the, we were Everybody or everybody within didn't really gets the open access thing in the research department, and so we were quite bold and quite brave in the policy that we developed. Um, other organisations that don't have almost wholesale um, buy-in across the organisation, we were just talking about this just actually before the microphones were turned on, we were talking about organisational buy-in, um, might have to make a more limited tiptoe into open access rather than us, which would just, just die from there and very big. Um, so I suppose this awareness of your organisational buy-in might dictate the extent to which you can um, uh, develop an open access, open access policy, at least to some difficult choices being made. Um, in, in our case, uh, <clears throat> there's, I don't think there's any issue with respect to the content that we publish because we've, we've covered that fairly well. So where we do have an issue, and it's one that, that Matthew raised, is on the associated data sets. Um, our policy also requires that the associated data sets uh, be made available open access, and, and uh, as you said, it's easy in theory, but it's more difficult to get that done in practice. For the content that's published externally, for example, the journal articles, there are, there are two issues, and we don't know yet because the policy only just went into effect, but it's the compliance. It's finding out that something was published externally, and being able to capture the author of some good manuscript in, in our repository. We are working on agreements with Elsevier, with Taylor <coughs> Francis, with Springer, uh, in order to, to wrap that up and have it uh, done institutionally. Uh, and, and so as we <coughs> Yeah, for us, um, the policy change was very straightforward. I mean, we had full buy-in from the start, so that, that was easy. Same issues really, it, data remains quite a big issue for us in the biomedical field. Um, compliance is an issue as well, and I guess we're not in the game to change markets, but it would be nice if the market did change a bit. Um, and I'm thinking of APCs, at the level they're at seems unsustainable. It would be good to see development in, in the market. And so, yeah, so we open it up to any of your questions on any of the themes that have been covered. Um, but yeah, if you want to use that general question as a focus, then, then that's good. Um, and Bev, just want to go to the, the nearest person to you. Hi, I'm Rene Lai, just a question about um, archive material. I know you've, uh, the last speaker said you couldn't do it, but uh, I think this is more for the World Bank. I think some historical information we may have gone to very useful to two researchers. Any thoughts that I know it would take time to do, whether in least in theory any historic information could be covered. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, in in our case, we we our content is digitized. We've we've got everything that we've published back to the early nineties in digital format. So we're working our way backwards. So we, we started, I believe, with three years, and we've gone back a further five years. So we have eight years of published content that's in our repository today. We'll go back further, and of course, everything new is, is being added. So we, 
we've captured a lot of the legacy content. We obviously, we can't go back to 1946, but, but we'll go back to the early 90s. Thank you. Yes. Taking that no, we can't. I mean, so we, we have an institutional repository, which is called Research for Developments, where all of the outputs from our research, research are supposed to appear, but sometimes they might just be references to, say, um, articles that have been published. Um, whether they're open access or not is uh, luck of the draw, really. What we can't do is retrospectively go back and make all of that material openly accessible. Um, I think it's just logistically quite difficult. That's probably the only reason. But, um, we funded a, a project called the Backfiles Digitization Project, which um, which did actually do this. And some some of the journals that came forward and asked for their um, asked for their back issues to be digitized, you know, go back into the into the 19th century. Uh, we didn't have full coverage for the biomedical field, but we did do quite a lot, and that was in partnership with the National Institutes of Health. So, I mean, I think you you, you can do that sort of thing. And actually, that sounds like an enormous, the expensive project, but it wasn't. It was. It was quite contained. Can I qualify what I said? Yeah. Um, when I said that we have everything back to the 1990s, that's what we have published. Uh, there, there is uh, things that have been published externally that uh, that we're, we're, we certainly we have a thousand journal articles where we have the metadata. We can link to it. Whether or not it's open access is a separate question. And then just very briefly. There's also a, a work done at the World Bank called Economic and Sector Work, ESW. Uh, and there was a policy at the institution that that, that had to be put in the, the institutional repository, which is different from the open access repository that we have done, the open knowledge repository. And there has been an effort to go back and, and capture those that were not filed uh, where they should have been filed so that we can bring them into the, to our open knowledge repository. Um, the question is, uh, or rather uh, talking about sustainability in the APCs, one, one of our difficulties in Africa is the access to that money because, uh, I mean, for instance, uh, some of our uh, contributors uh, from the rural areas uh, have contributed wonderful papers on, for instance, snake bite and dog bites and tetanus and so on. But they don't actually get any research funding. So you know, where do they get the APC from? Where do we get? Uh, you know, increasingly we've got uh, contributors from Africa, and uh, as we know, that uh, African countries have got great difficulty in providing those kinds of funds. So maybe a, a different way of looking at that is for a journal to apply to the uh, to a fund rather than for the uh, for the author. That, that might be, a, you know, one way of looking at it. But I just wanted to ask uh, a provocative question, and that is looking into the future. What is the sustainability of uh, uh, the impact factor and of um, organizations such as PubMed, when you've got huge organizations uh, much bigger than them, like Google? qualified, but I'll, I'll have a go. Um, on APCs, I, I don't have an answer for this, but I was very interested with the idea that was raised yesterday that there'd be some common fund established. Um, the, the context here, I think, was the publication. Uh, the context here was the, um, I actually forget what it was, it was the publication Someone help me out here. What, uh, what you pay when you um, in, in South Africa when you um, uh, publication subsidy. the publication yes. subsidy exactly. Thank you. Um, that that in some way be used to, to form some sort of common fund for APCs. I think that would be a very interesting way to go because um, <coughs> you're right. Obviously, the local health concerns not necessarily funded by. Um, by uh, research funders. So on sustainability of impact factors, um, again, I don't know. I mean, one thing I do notice is that researchers find them very hard to let go of, um, even if, in my experience, if I talk to people who's, in a way, whose whole lives have been about open data and about open literature and open everything, they still occasionally fall back on saying, 
a rod on so and so, you published in a high impact factor journal. And th these habits are very hard to break. And I don't know how what the future is for impact factors, but I think the consensus here is that we'd be a lot better off if they were to a, to a large extent dropped. Uh, on the impact factor, I, I think that it's going to require a cultural change and it's going to require a change in the incentive system within academia uh, in terms of tenure and promotion. And I think that it's, uh, it will happen, and I think it will happen because the, uh, was it Daniel here who was here from Kenya earlier today? Um, the new generation of researchers have, uh, uh, it's certainly in, in different parts of the world, have grown up in a different environment than their predecessors and uh, using social media and so forth. And I think that uh, these alternative metrics will, will begin to hold sway over time. Just, just one more thing on that. I mean, it seems to me that it makes the evaluation of work a great deal more work intensive. Um, the, the Wellcome Trust over the last year and a half has become much more focused on individuals than on programs. And, I think what that means is that the interview process and the scrutiny that's applied to applications is, is far higher than it was previously because you, know, you can't simply scan an application to look for eye-catching highlights. You have to understand the work that people have done and the value beyond simply where they've published. Uh, I only have something to say really on the, on the APC front. In the, and I really know about the UK context, um, where the, centrally, the central research budget and the central research councils that administer that budget are moving to a different system from including APCs in um, the budget for a specific research program through to giving block grants to UK higher education institutions where the higher education institution would administer the APC fund on behalf of the institution as a whole. Um, which might help out for those individuals who are writing papers which haven't necessarily had a bit come from a budgetary, budgeted research project. Um, whether that model works elsewhere, I really, I really don't know, but the, certainly one of the few things which come from this conference where different might, I'm not ever, I'm definitely not saying we're going to do this, but one of those options which is realistic is to look at block funding for APC charges at a regional or national or a local level, I'm not really sure, but it is one of those areas which seems to be a sticking point, and it is something that the donor could make a difference about um, by looking at this block grant system. We don't do it for our own research, um, because we don't want the administration hassle, we just want the researchers to be able to have to administer the APCs themselves, I'm afraid, because there's only a quarter of me. Um, I was talking to Laura Chernovich yesterday evening and one of the things she said was that she thought there needed to be more evidence-based research on how the open access initiatives in Africa were working because lots of people are doing things but no one really knows um, what sort of um, effects they're having, what works, what doesn't work and so your idea about doing some evidence-based research in Africa I think would be very um, well taken up and I just wanted to know, um, I imagine that there are people in here who, who can discuss that further but I, since she isn't here today I thought I'd put that to you and uh, she may in fact want to talk to you about it. Uh, Felix Wood, um, I thought I could just clarify the issue of uh, Subsidy because it's been mentioned once or twice, uh, so there's clarity on it. Uh, in South Africa, uh, it, my author only gets a publication subsidy after the paper is published, not before. Uh, and it's going to be published in an ISI journal. So those are two issues. Uh, so the open access journal is going to be an ISI listed journal to get a subsidy. Just some clarification. And I think a model uh, as advanced by uh, Matthew is worth considering in the country. Maybe that's something we should be looking at in terms of a block ABC grant um, that could come out of funds available for the uh, uh, for the subsidy. I think that would be an idea.
in direct response to that because I was going to raise that anyhow. Um, the idea of a block grant to pay for uh, open access publishing in South Africa would cost 2% of the block grant. And it was suggested by the Academy of Science of South Africa and accepted by the Department of Science and Technology. And the universities fell about in screams of anguish, banging their heels on the floor and said they would not part with one penny. So I suggest to South African researchers that you start lobbying your universities. Issue a few death threats and see if you can get some <laughs> Because it's not coming to you, it's going to the institutions. The other thing I wanted to say is, you were talking about how you keep an ongoing sustainability of your projects. And Matthew, you were talking about it, but it came up everywhere. I wanted to issue a warning about the idea of money versus other kinds of impact and the importance of strong impact evidence of the non-money impacts. A cautionary tale is the Human Sciences Research Council, which you heard about earlier, a brilliant publishing project, working wonderfully as open access, giving huge results in a non-monetary sense, and the accountants have decided that it should be profit making. So you can guess what's beginning to happen now. So I think we should look very hard at the models of impact that are not financial and produce lots of evidence in that way. I don't know if you agree. Uh, Madhavi Sunder's latest book, um, published by Yale University Press, is dealing with those kinds of things. But it's an interesting topic, and I think we have to watch that reversion factor.
work with libraries and universities to, I, I, don't, I don't quite know what this term means, but bandwidth management. <laughs> I think I roughly know what that means, but they work with both training, I think it's mostly training rather than sort of hardware, you know, really you know, helping them uh, on a technical level, I think it's more of a capacity building level about how they can manage their bandwidth. Um, so again, we have those small programs, but it's possible that, that again, maybe that is the point of engagement for a data like Diffy, you know, improving that infrastructure, both from the demand side, so improving the technical infrastructure, but also from the supply side, trying to make things more accessible um, when they're produced. Um, so I think it's a good idea. And maybe libraries, may, yeah, maybe they're a good point of engagement. Um, I'm not sure. What, what I do know is that whenever I turn up at open access events like this, there's lots of librarians and there's lots of talk about libraries, so that must be a flag to me that they're an important node in the network of the system. It's not one that I understand right now. Next question. Um, this is a perfect, uh, I think it is in Carlos's uh, presentation. Uh, we talked about the, uh, there's somewhere in the mission statement, I believe, of uh, the World Bank that, about sharing your knowledge right down to the village level, I think, right? Uh, oh, it, anyway. We have as a mission, part of our mission statement is uh, enabling others to help themselves by sharing our knowledge. And, and then President Zelik in a speech talked about making the knowledge accessible to everyone down to the village healthcare worker. Well, actually, I just wanted to, I was wondering if there are, there could be other alternative, way, alternative ways of making that possible. And here, I'm thinking of more um, kind of crowdsourcing. And I'm looking at perhaps the model of, um, I'm not sure exactly how it works, but like um, Global Voices Online, where you have an army of volunteers who are translating um, news items and things like that in the various languages. And I think that could be an effective way of kind of getting to local communities. I don't know if that's a, uh, something you may be thinking about, because it also comes back to the issue of translation that has been going, um, kind of running through a number of our presentations. And I think, again, when we think of translation, we are thinking of the major languages of publication, but we're not really thinking about probably what at the village level or at the local level better. People on the ground, down in the trenches, may be working with what languages they may be working in. So that could be possibly a, a way of looking at how to get information out as well. Let me just, uh, I agree with you completely. Um, <clears throat> let me say that we're open to all alternatives. Uh, I guess on one level, by making our content accessible under CC BY, it's not precluding anyone else from taking up those, those initiatives and, and doing it. So uh, I think that our policy enables that, or at least puts no barrier in the way. We might look at ways to help promote that and, and enhance that. And the issue of translation, I think you're absolutely correct. I mean, I forget what the numbers are, but Nigeria has something like 40 languages, I, I, I forget. So, um, <clears throat> and South Africa has many languages and, and, and so forth. Uh, and we're very bad at that. Uh, we, our working language is English. When we undertake translation, it's to one of the, what we call seven international languages, which would be Arabic, French, Portuguese, Russian, Spanish, Chinese, uh, and English. So, and, and I think that you're correct. Open access is, the, the knowledge is only accessible if it's accessible in a medium and language that the individual has access to. Uh, and I think that we're a long way from achieving that. All right, the next question. My name is Uri Klein from the European Federation of National Academies of Sciences. Um, I have a, a remark, I suppose, a um, word of praise, a question to all three of you, and an invitation to the remark. Um, the issue of impact has been raised, and I think that is indeed crucial. We have been working in Europe uh, with a number of diverse institutions um, on the concept of societal impact that might be useful also for the way you look at impact of uh, open access.
access published material on uh, development issues. And we'd be very happy uh, to share the past and ongoing work with you on this, some of which indeed has been carried out also with non-European institutions. We're doing the same in Asia, so Africa would be the next uh, logical step. The word of praise is for the courage of uh, EFID on, in terms of including data sets into their um, open access. Um, well, it's not yet a strategy, but it's going to be very soon to practice, I understand. Um, we've been working with the European Commission um, on their um, open science uh, approach <coughs> as part of the digital agenda, which is a 100 billion research program or practice and action program. And they keep shying away from the issue of data. So it would be very, very good if we could use um, your approach and showcase your courage in this context uh, so that perhaps we bring them back on track in that um, respect. Uh, linked to that, um, all three of you are working in environments where very often you need to cooperate, collaborate with um, governmental institutions for data. So I wonder what your policies will be um, when it comes to uh, quasi-governmental data sets um, that you co-develop, co-create, and then would have to co-manage one way or another. Which rules will apply? Have you thought about it? And last but not least, that is a comment also to a concern voiced by one of the colleagues um, further up in the audience. Um, the diversity of institutional preparedness indeed uh, to deal with open access uh, varies in Europe as much as it does here in, in Africa. We will be having uh, tomorrow uh, a get together of the European Academies and of the uh, African Academies of Sciences, representatives of course with all of them, but also with UNESCO, with INAS and a few other uh, key players where we try and develop a common approach um, to uh, interacting with, with um, with governments, the relevant ministries, the relevant institutions, would be very good, again, if uh, the FID and perhaps also the World Bank would become part of that conversation. And the idea is to bring this on the agenda of the EU, AU, European Union, African Union, uh, heads of states meeting one of these uh, coming years. You're absolutely right, that is one of the key stumbling blocks for uh, intra-African cooperation. Um, uh, thanks for the positive words on on our policy, um, particularly with respect to the data sets. I did mention as I went along that that's probably the clause within the policy that's caused a little bit of disgruntlement. But a few people have discussed this with us, um, a few people who think that our 12-month period is not enough. Um, certainly two, two higher education lobby groups in the UK came in too difficult to tell us that that clause wasn't workable. But within about 35 seconds, they completely changed their mind and were rather embarrassed about it. Um, because the, the simple argument is that, you, as, I, as I mentioned as I went along, you would need to persuade us that it was better for development that you hung onto your data for longer than 12 months before releasing it. And it's very, very difficult to argue against that. Um, one of their arguments was that 12 months is not enough and you'll force people to rush to publish and that will reduce the quality of their work. Our response was, what are you doing if you can't get your work published within 12 months? <laughs> what is it that you're playing? Um, <laughs> and again, they thought, oh, fair enough. And probably the subtext is, of course, that people want to hang on to their data so they can milk it and milk it and milk it. That's not good for development. It's good for your career, maybe, but it's not good for development. Um, so, as I, as I say, they had to completely change their perspective on that. Um, on the quasi government data sets, I always struggle to imagine what those, those things are. But one way of, I can't even talk about the domestic situation. I don't know. Pointed at you, it works. <laughs> <laughs> pointed at me, it winds. Pointed at Carlos, I think that tells us something. Uh, the UK government is very strong now on opening up access to all manner of material that it produces. All sorts of data sets, okay, so the Ministry of Defence is clearly not going to release all sorts of different types of data sets, but all. All government departments are obliged, so you can find out my boss's salary online if you go and look from that kind of data. So DFID doesn't really produce that sort of, the kind of data which the foreign or it's sort of what we call the Home Office that will produce as data sets about the population of the UK. But all of those are freely available for you to access, use, manipulate, to use as research. So I also did mention that actually what they haven't really thought about is about um, 
the research which is commissioned by departments. So departments gather information, that's the stuff which government wants to make transparent, and in fact it lobbies internationally. Um, but for departments like my own, there's only a few of us to actually fund research. They haven't actually thought about that. But for DFID, our open access to research uh, policy is part of DFID's overall strategy for making all of its data transparent. And that's, that's all in, in inverted commas, because it's not, it's not ever going to be actually all. What that means, though, when we work with other governments, other uh, multinational institutions, or uh, things like the World Bank, I honestly don't know. I do know that DFID rarely funds research, not rarely, a, a minority of DFID's research is funded solely by DFID. We normally work in partnership. And actually that's one of the teasing problems that we're having at the moment is when we fund research in partnership with another organisation, whose open access policy applies or does any open access policy apply? Ours doesn't look like anyone else's. <laughs> so, we, we go, so we're just working that one out now. Oh, and yeah, please do send me some information about the thing that you talked about earlier on. <laughs> um, likewise, I'd be interested in information on, on this initiative. Um, I'll just, I, I agree with everything Matthew said in, in terms of the, when, you, when you have different organizations collaborating, um, we also have an open data policy and require that the data sets data sets associated with, with a research article or any publication be made open access and it's it's in the policy, I think. It's in the exception in terms of our getting it done, so it, it takes a while. In terms of the quasi-government data sets, um, I, I am trying to push for that any project uh, of the many bank projects that, that are funded at the country level, any knowledge or research that's generated through the result of that bank-funded project um, be made open access according to our policy. Um, that's a conversation that's underway. I'm not sure how long it will take to make that happen, but it is an objective and it is being discussed within the institution. Um, the only thing I'd add to that is, in a way, I think whose policy applies is that it's a bit like a card game, the, the, the highest card wins. So if, if you have one partner assuming quality of contribution, which is quite a big if actually, but Assuming that, then you know, if, if one if one policy requires a certain thing and it's a higher standard than the other, then that one should apply, and also potentially that partner will end up paying. That's certainly what we do. But um, I guess sharing costs is, is a more ideal model. We will pay for you. I think we're going to take one final question. Let's move on to the microphone. It's not a question. Uh, I, I think uh, now we are the three of you sitting. We we're talking about, uh, I'm concerned about capacity building. And uh, uh, earlier, uh, Marcel actually pointed out something about raising, uh, let me use the word raising, not training, raising uh, authors, publishers, reviewers in Africa. Because we're, look, we're looking at survivor and uh, sustainer, then Africa requires to have uh, good journals. Okay. I'm trying to buy out about it towards the journal thing, but if we're going to have persons that can come up with good OA journals, then they need to be trained. So we need to have that. Um, I'm very concerned about much you you're looking for suggestion. I suppose this is one. You could come in there. And then two, uh, institutions in the West, Central Africa, and if we were to uh, check uh, the website, the, the, the internet, you find that the South African universities are quite populated on the internet when it comes to repository. Uh, Kenya, maybe Nigeria, but even Nigeria just four schools. So it is going to be some funding going towards a uh, repository build up, then it should be to the schools, the libraries, help them come online, help them get the sound repository, and then they can come on into the open access uh, stream. I think those two areas will be a good area to invest in. 
to put them in. And I believe the development I know to warrant uh, the approval of your superior so you don't get shot. I know I said last question, but Marcel was jumping up and down, so she just don't mind taking me. Just a quick, quick one, lateral thinking. Uh, 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 an issue that, uh, that Tom raised this morning about mentioning uh, an APC at 250, which seems totally unrealistic, but that the issue of actually putting pressure on Publishers to actually uh, uh, diminish uh, AFC uh, would seem to be something that uh, uh, your, your agency could actually do. In the same way as the Wellcome Trust managed to put pressure on the university in raising the studentships uh, by raising their own studentships substantially, that actually worked. Maybe there was a way that it would actually work as well. So, in, in a way, uh, the, the differential between North and South uh, APC, which uh, obviously the, the, the way the way of the system is obviously not functional. That was clearly made. That point was clearly made a few times. But if you, your organisation, if in particular, can I actually have that role of uh, pushing that game, because no, the purchase by themselves would have no interest in diminishing the, the APC. Uh, that is quite logical. But uh, at the same time, the, 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 there is an effort to be made, maybe in that direction, just lateral thinking. I'll, I'll say as a guarded response to that. I'm just thinking that I work for the UK government, so I have to be a little bit careful about this. So my personal say, <laughs> um, that there's going to be a limit to the extent to which um, any government department, but the extent to which DFID would dabble in what is a legitimate business. <laughs> um, kind of, I'll put it like that, I mean, we have a centre right. Government, um, publishing is a legitimate business activity. Uh, I, 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 my first impression is it would be quite difficult for Dippet to lobby or work with publishers to reduce their, their own profits. Um, that's not to say, however, that the uh, at government level, not at Dippet level, at government level, there is, um, and there has been over the last six months or more, 12 months, an extensive discussion with publishers. Um, uh, so a couple of people mentioned yesterday this thing called the Finch Report. Um, I don't know how many people uh, in, in this room are familiar with the Finch Report, but the Finch Report was basically commissioned by central government, uh, written by a group headed by a person called Janet Finch, hence the Finch Report, which made recommendations back to government about what it should do about open access for journal publications. So it's, again, it's that tunnel vision, it's about journal publications. And publishers were involved, amongst many other stakeholders, in the development of the recommendations of that report, some of which were outlined yesterday, and some of which look very like our own recommendations. In fact, they are the same as our own recommendations for journal articles. Um, that was just the beginning. The government, government, central government had to give a response to that particular report, but it hasn't necessarily formulated central government policy. And the discussion with publishers is ongoing in the UK. So I'm afraid this is a domestic discussion. Um, but of course, most of those big publishers are international businesses, so maybe it'll, it'll um, uh, go out to the further reaches of those organisations. But it, but it is a difficult one. It's a, it's a legal activity to make money from publishing. So there's only a certain, certain extent to which you can dabble in that. And, uh, yeah. So this is a discussion that could go on, and I think should go on, and will go on amongst um, participants here. Um, we're over time, so I'm going to uh, bring us to a close for, for this part. Um, so it just remains to thank both the panel for all of their um, presentations and input, and all of yourselves for helping to make that such a good panel discussion. So thank you very much.